president of AARP Louisiana. AARP strives to ensure that people 50 plus and their families live their best lives. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, social mission organization with a membership. We help people in different ways, from information and products to advocacy and education. AARP has two offices. One is located in Baton Rouge, the other in New Orleans. Additional information will be provided for you listed at the end of the program. You know, our work is accomplished by a dynamic group of volunteers and staff. And we know that many of you are volunteers and we just want to say thank you and our staff working with you, you all do a great job. So on behalf of AARP Louisiana, I'd like to welcome you to today's conversation, the historical significance of black public schools in New Orleans, I'll repeat it. The historical significance of black public schools in New Orleans. You know, here in New Orleans, when people meet for a first time, there are two questions that we can pretty often expect to hear. And those questions are, what neighborhood did you grow up in as a child? And the other one is, what high school did you attend? Yes, high school is how we make connections and jumpstart a conversation. I grew up in the seventh ward in Gentilly and I attended McDonough 35 Preparatory High School. So that's one way that I start conversations. So to celebrate Black history, we wanted to further explore the history of Black public schools, noted school teachers and leaders and administrators. Uh, and we'll also have an opportunity to join the conversation and ask questions and share memories as alums of those various schools. Now, we're gonna have a poll and I'm going to read to you the instructions for the poll to make sure that we're all together on it because Lynetta MacIver has given me absolute instructions to give to you. So in order to ask questions, uh, you're gonna have a toolbar with a question and answer area. And we have designed this event to take your questions and allow for our moderator and guests to answer them. Your questions should be entered into that box and they will be screened and read by staff. Y'all got that? Okay. Your questions can also be asked live by you if you're requested to unmute your microphone. Got that? Simply type your question into the text field and click submit. If you would like to share your thoughts with other participants, you can share in another box called chat. You see that box called chat? The group chat can also be found on your toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Anything you answer, uh, enter rather, in that box can be seen by all our participants today. Got it? Lynette, I read those instructions is there anything you'd like to reiterate or add to them? Nope, perfect. Great, okay. Now I'm really honored to introduce our special speakers. They're friends of mine as well and former colleagues. Uh, joining me today, our guest speakers are Dr. Raphael Kashmir and Daryl Kilbert. I'll start with Dr. Kashmir because we're gonna talk about history. Dr. Raphael. Brenda, let me interrupt you. Before you go to that, let's go to our first poll question so we can see who we have in the audience. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. The first poll question is what decade did you graduate high school? Okay, we'll be closing our poll in five seconds. Okay. 
So let's see the poll results. Brenda, can you read the poll results? Sure can. Uh, those, what decade did you graduate high school? 26% uh, graduated between 1950 and 1959. 32% graduated from 1960 to 1969. 35% graduated in 1970 to 1979. 3% uh, 1980 to 1989. 3% from 1990 to 1999. And for those from 2000 plus, none. Those are the youngsters, huh? Yeah. So that down is that you know it, it's almost like our membership, in 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 many ways, what I consider conservatives, moderates, and uh, and and more uh, on a conservative, modern, and what's the other one? Independence and the rest. Anyway, yeah. uh, it's it's very reflective, very interesting. So welcome everybody, and we're glad to know what our audience is like today. Lynetta, would you like me to go ahead now and... and uh... Uh, well, if you still have your poll box showing, please click the X in the right upper hand corn, corner, and it will disappear from your screen. Continue, Brenda. Sure, as I mentioned before, I'm just honored to introduce our guest speakers their friends and their colleagues of mine as well. Uh, Dr. Raphael Kashmir is a professor emeritus, University of New Orleans. He was a member of the history department of the, New of the University of New Orleans from 1971 to 2007, where he taught American colonial history, American constitutional history, and African-American history. He retired with the prestigious rank of Serafia de Leda, University Professor. Dr. Kashmir has been active in the NAACP since 1960 and has held numerous local, state, and regional offices. You know, I personally remember Raphael and his tenacious civil rights leadership beginning in his youth right here in New Orleans. Our next speaker is Daryl Kilbert. And Daryl and I were certainly colleagues together in New Orleans Public Schools. Daryl served as superintendent of New Orleans Public Schools from 2006 to 2012. Before being elevated to superintendent, Kilbert worked as a teacher, assistant principal, principal, area superintendent, since starting his career in 1979. He has been praised by parents and students for his no-nonsense approach, most notably when he took the reins of L.C. Forche High School in the mid-1990s, and he increased graduation rates. He improved grades and increased classroom attendance. After working as a principal at George Washington Carver High School in 2004, Kilbert was promoted to an area superintendent of schools by former superintendent, Anthony Amato. There he, he remained until his appointment to interim superintendent and finally to superintendent in 2006. So it's been my pleasure to introduce these two. Any other poll questions? Uh, um, not, at this, not at this time. Okay then, we're gonna begin with the historical perspective. Raphael, historically we understand that there were only six original black high schools in New Orleans. When, why, and how were they created? Well, I'm gonna give you a little background, especially for those of you who, who long for the good old days when we had our own little black schools and we were so much better off and we were so happy. Black schools at the turn of the 20th century on the so-called separate but equal at best, well, unequal, at worst, non-existent. Black education was designed to keep Blacks subordinate to whites, poor. This is what the president of Tulane University said in 1900 about Black education. I believe in educating the Negro. I believe in educating the mule. 
I believe in educating all animals. That was the president of Tulane University. That's what most whites thought about blacks at that particular time. In 1900, there were 35 public high schools in the entire state of Louisiana. That means that most parishes did not have even one public high school. Sadly, none of those 35 public high schools existed for blacks. There was not a single public high school for black Americans in 1900. Now we had just lost the right to vote. Most blacks had lost the right to vote by 1900. From a high of about 135,000 in 1896 to less than 5,000 in 1900. So you couldn't vote the rascals out because you didn't have the right to vote. You could petition. In fact, I mentioned that blacks had gone from trying to advocate for separate but equal to begging for crumbs, for begging for crumbs. So blacks petitioned the local school board for a high school. There were four public high schools for whites, but none for blacks. So they petitioned the, public high, the, the uh, school board in New Orleans for a high school. The response was to eliminate grades six, seven, and eight. So not only did you not have any black high school, you only had public high schools that went from first through fifth grade. The whole idea was we only need to educate blacks for the kind of jobs that they will need. They don't need to be highly educated. We certainly don't want people who are going to be in a position where they're going to compete against whites. The majority of the white teachers, I mean, the majority of the teachers in black public high schools were white women. Now, these were basically women who did not qualify to teach in white schools. And they predominated the classrooms in black schools. My grandmother, who was born during Reconstruction, mentioned that she had some, she had white school teachers. Some were good, some were not so good. They obviously were not good role models for blacks. There were only three private high schools for blacks in 1900. New Orleans University, which had a high school department, Strait University, which also had a high school department, and Southern University. Now, what was ironic about that is most of these students at these so-called universities were high school students. Well, Southern closed in 1912, relocated to East Baton Rouge in 1913, which means now you only had two high schools. Southern University was gone. They left Strait University, which was uh, organized by the Congregational Church, and New Orleans, which was organized by the Methodist Church. Now, for Black Catholics who did not want to attend these schools because they required you to attend their religious services, that was a dilemma. So now there was an increased demand, which the school board finally agreed to, to convert an older white elementary school into a high school for Blacks in 1917. That was the beginning of McDonald number 35. Didn't have a lab, a science lab, a very, very small library, but it had a very ingenious and creative, energetic principal, Mr. John W. Hoffman. Now, one of the things he did was to add an evening school for Black students, not just uh, high school students, but an evening school. Every Alexander who I had the privilege of teaching a couple of times, he mentioned that he lived in Napoleonville where there were no schools elementary or secondary schools for Blacks. And so he came to New Orleans where he was able to get a certificate from an evening school at McDonald 35, and he subsequently became a high school graduate. Now he didn't graduate from college until 1975. I tell you when he came to University of New Orleans for uh, post high school, I mean, post, uh, element, post secondary education. He was a remarkable student. I remember when he was in uh, university, when he was elect in the legislature, he would spend his time in the legislature and he would come to classes at night. I said, you don't have to come that I want to be here, he said. And he was an inspiration for the students who were there. Principal Hoffman had a predominantly male faculty. There were very few women at that first school. But what was interesting was that these were very well qualified 
teachers, many of them became principals in their own right, like uh, Lawrence Crocker, who became the founding principal of Booker T. Washington, Jesse Richards, who was my principal at, high, at Clark School, Charles Rousseff, who later became a principal at Booker T. Washington. They were on the faculty at McDonald 35. They created a normal school to train more black teachers at Valina C. Jones, which had been opened as, of course, a public high school, one of the best public elementary schools in the country. One of the persons who never became a principal who became legendary from McDonald 35 was George Carpenter. If you went to a uh, high school in New Orleans, whether you went to McDonald 35, if you attended Clark or Coyne or one of the people, you knew about Professor Carpenter because many of your teachers had been trained at McDonald 35. And they talked about this legendary teacher, taught Spanish, taught English, he taught French, he could have taught anything. I happened to have met him when he was serving as a consultant. He was somebody who was fascinated. He taught two of my sisters who went to McDonald 35. Well, in addition to McDonald 35, the school board finally agreed to create a vocational school. I mean, there was some opposition to a vocational school because there were some blacks who said that we need more than to be trained and working with our hands. We need to continue expanding college prep schools. And instead of having a voc tech school, we ought to have more high schools. Well, the school board at first complained didn't have enough money. At this point, they had not built any public high schools from the ground up. But largely through support from the Rosenwald Fund. If you ever wonder why there are so many schools and so many institutions named for Rosenwald, it's because without this fund, particularly in the South, we would not have had any schools. Rosenwald's contributed about $70 million for educating through school construction, Blacks primarily in the South. Now, I understand that that would be worth about three quarters of a billion dollars today. So he, the Rosenwald Fund agreed to put up money for a Volk Tech school. And with support from the WPA, they finally constructed Booger T. Washington High School. And as I mentioned, the first principal was Lawrence Crocker, who agreed not only to provide Blacks with training in welding and bricklaying and the kind of uh, skills that Blacks predominate in. But also he had a very good college prep program. I remember when I went to UNO in the 1960s, there were many Black graduates from Booker T. Washington who excelled in math. And I found out they had a very good math department at that particular time. But also in 1942, L.B. Landry, Lord Beaconfield Landry, which had been opened as an elementary school in 1938, was persuaded to begin offering high school courses. And so in 1942, they began to add seventh and then eighth and ninth school. So now you had, in addition to McDonald 35, which I call the mother school of black education, you had Booker G. Washington and you had L.B. Landry. 1947, my alma mater, Joseph S. Clark, senior high school, open. But it began not on Bayou Road, but on Jumain. They had closed on another white school, again, an elementary white school, Benjamin Franklin, and converted it to Joseph S. Clark, named for the president of Southern University who had served for a long time. He had just retired in 1947. So Clark began on Jumain School, a very small school, Enrollment capacity between five and 600, no labs for high school, a very small uh, library, very small cafeteria, but that became Joseph S. Clark High School. And then they added to this school what they call the annex on Bayou Road. Now Bayou Road School had been built really in 1923, a very school, a school that had been built for blacks, but the whites in the neighborhood objected. They didn't want a black high school in their neighborhood. And so after only a few months, they began building Craig, which was farther away from these whites. And blacks who originally had been expected to attend this new Bayou Road school were transferred there. And this school was now open for whites. And it remained a white school until it closed down and it was returned to blacks. It became Clark Annex because it was a bigger facility, it became the main building and the original clock became the annex 
which is now A.J. Bell. It remained a part of Clark until it became a separate school in 1954 as A.J. Bell. Now, Clark was the only black high school in downtown New Orleans. So if you live in what, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, where I live, you expect to attend Clark. Now, again, just a little bit later, they opened another high school for Black Subtown, Walter L. Coyne, named for the Black Republican political leader. And it was designed to accommodate those Blacks who live near the river, who were not interested necessarily in a vote tech uh, uh, career. And so Coyne opened in 1949 as a, uh, a pre-college pre high school was that meant you had three high schools for Blacks uptown, only one, again, Clark, which was forced to platoon as students. So it was overcrowded, a school that originally designed for 500 uh, on Dumaine, a school that had been designed for about 550 to 600 for Blacks on Bayou Road. And again, because it was the only public high school, it enrolled and swelled to over 2,000 students. So it had to platoon. Classes began as early as seven o'clock in the morning and ended about five o'clock. Now you could have schedules in between. For example, my first year at Bell, I attended classes from 8.50 until 2.15. Now, what happened however, as a result of a teacher equalization lawsuit where they finally equalized salaries for black and white teachers. Because before that particular time, the highest paid public school teachers were white men and then white women and then black men, and then white uh, black women. Even though black women teachers constituted about 55% of all of the teachers, they were the lowest paid. But finally in 1942, they equalized salaries. Now, one of the beneficiaries of that was Jesse O. Richards, who was the principal of Clark. He became the highest paid principal in the state, black and white, because he had the highest enrollment. But things became so bad because every inch of the school was used for classroom. My English class when I was a sophomore was in the boys' locker room, obviously for all, all black, I mean, all men. My high school uh, class, uh, Holman classmate was in the band room. We had classes on the stage. We had classes in the cafeteria. We used to call out uh, area the cafeteria because it was all the auditorium, the cafeteria as well as classroom. It was so crowded. Finally, the school board agreed to open a second black high school downtown, George Washington Cullum, on the site of what had been Gaudet High School. And of course, when uh, Culver opened in 1958, it was my senior year, about half of the faculty from Clark transferred to Culver. In fact, the first principal of Culver was one of the persons who had been tutored by Jesse Richards. Milton Becknell became the first principal of the high school. Alvin Aubrey became the first principal of the junior high school. Walter Moriel, who was my uh, mentor at Clark, became the first principal of the elementary school. And so you had more schools being built for Blacks, but they were not equal because I know uh, we had a very small library, which also, of course, was a study hall. And, and the painting could serve as a classroom. We did not have a chemistry lab at Clark. So those schools, which were supposed to be separate and equal, obviously were not. But at the same time, we had an outstanding faculty because many of the Blacks who taught there were wise enough to go into other fields, but there were no Blacks, for example, in engineering. You couldn't get an engineering degree here in Louisiana. There were no Black architects. There were no blacks in banking. So we had a, an overly qualified black faculty who, who would have been outstanding elsewhere, but they were limited where they had to teach. You know what happened as a result of so-called school desegregation. We never really had school desegregation in New Orleans. There was an exodus of whites out of the schools into neighboring Jefferson, St. Bernard, across the lake in uh, Slidell and so forth. But those former schools like John McDonald, that some of my classmates had to pass. Warren Easton, some of my former classmates at Clark had to pass. Nichols, the school that I had to pass every day to get to Clark. 
those schools were, quote, desegregated, but it meant an exodus of whites. And they became largely black schools with a sprinkling of Asians, a sprinkling of Hispanics. And I remember the last time I went to my high school at Clark in 2016, I'd say 85% of the students who were there were blacks, maybe 10 to 15% were Hispanics. I had no sense of what this school was about. The faculty was racially mixed, but a lot of the blacks who in the past would have been the teachers who had staff clock were gone. There were shortage of teachers. A lot of the teachers, I'd say maybe 20 to 25% of the people who were there were people who were a part of the Teach for America program. They were not people who had been trained in education. Many of them really were not concerned too much about being educators, but this was an opportunity for them to uh, pay off their student loans by teaching in public schools. So one of the last points I want to make for, point now, for, for now is that for those of us who were there while we were there in these schools, like Clark, the rest of the world did not exist. I, I, I make sense to a lot of people, probably the happiest part of my time in uh, my life between the ages of six and uh, 21 when I got, to, got out of college was my period at Clark High School. The, the people who we met there became lifelong friends. Even though we were crowded, maybe because we were on top of each other, we learned how to get along with each other. But the one thing I learned and it remained for me a part of the training for, that I was trying to pass on other people was discipline and dignity. That's something that our principal, Jesse Richards, stressed. Discipline and dignity, that you learn how to interact on the basis of equality with anybody. We didn't have any sense of inferiority. You know, they used to say, well, to be successful, you have to be better than whites. Okay, we better be better than whites. You have to be able to pass the test. Give us a test, we're gonna pass the test. And most of us went on to be successful. And even though it was not designed for blacks to be successful, even though the structure was designed to keep blacks in dependent positions, suburban to whites, we didn't feel that we were unequal to anybody. I mean, we kind of had a chip on us, so that we went to Clark and then we knew we were good. And I remember when I went to LSU and there were a lot of my colleagues who went there. Something happened that shocked a lot of people. The first history test in the professor who had already gained, even in two, within the space of two years, legendary Henry Friedland, he was noted to be tough. Mm -hmm. And the very first test he gave, I made the highest score. I only made 76. I thought I made about 96, but I only made 76. He called the roll and he had the student to stand and he would announce the grade. I mean, I was C, so I was maybe about 20 out of a class of 100. So the, the passing grade was 47 for a D. So if you made less than 47, you failed. When he got to my hand, he paused for a minute and said, 76, the highest grade. Now, as it turned out, the highest grade in each of his four classes was made by a black student. A student from Coyne had 77. A student from St. Mary's made 81. The highest grade was a Clark student who made 87, and that, that was a buzz around the campus. A black had made the highest grade in all of his classes. And that began to make people look differently. So while we went to public high schools that were underfunded, and in many cases, they did not measure up in some areas, we were prepared for a world that was not willing to accept us, but that we were demanding to accord us first class citizenship. I'll talk about some of those things later. So I'm sure Brother Kilwell has something more that he could add. Um, I just want to say this. Thank you so much for remembering some of these outstanding educators in these early days of schools. My grandmother was a teacher, and all of my aunts were teachers because that's what women did, right? Right. Uh, I remember hearing all of those names. And you mentioned something very interesting about most of the early teachers who were all white teachers. And then we had our black faculties that were uh, qualified blacks. So this would have definitely, right? A socioeconomic consequence 
for them and for our community at large. So how did that landscape, uh, Raphael, how did that change our African-American community with all of these educated professionals uh, and many others with the establishment of our black high schools? Well, teachers were of course solidly in the middle class, at least by profession. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not surprising if to, to learn that longshoremen, many of them didn't have great school education, made more money than school teachers. Mm -hmm. But unless you were going to be a postal carrier and sometimes you had teachers, I know I had several of my high school teachers who worked at Clark and then they went to work at, uh, in the post office. But it gave us a different status, a sense of importance. We had uh, one of the persons who I most remember was Miss Anna Lacayes, who lived in the Lower Ninth Ward where I live. She taught every one of my siblings. Mr. Kays could easily have passed for white. When she walked through the neighborhood, because she walked before she had enough money to have her own car, people who were playing cards or who were throwing dice would pause because Mr. Kays was coming. Yeah. One thing I most remember, she became the ranking teacher. We didn't have assistant principals at that particular time. She had a telephone in her classroom. And I can almost remember the day the telephone rang. Mr. Case, who rarely smiles, he wastes much time smiling, very devout Catholic, always praying for us poor sinners. She got off the phone and she was smiling because it was something important in that telephone call. It was a call from our principal. George Long was the principal. He had called to tell her about the Supreme Court decision in Brown. And this was in 1954. I had never heard of the Brown case. But she got off the phone and kind of explained to us what that meant. Then the principal himself came around and he was telling other uh, teachers what had happened. And I began to wonder what I go to school with my white neighbors because I lived in a poor, I'd say working poor, interracial neighborhood. Maybe 50, 60 percent of the people living in my neighborhood were white. I had to pass up a school to get to my school. And I wondered if these whites were gonna be attending my school. Of course, what began to happen was they began to move out into St. Bernard Parish or move into Jefferson, other parish. But the teachers who we had, these were role models. These were people we wanted to look up to. Now, they didn't make much money, but they looked like teachers. I often mention that they made less money but they would dress. They would come look like they would dress for a profession. I know my uh, female teachers would come dressed and they would change into a smock. But they looked like somebody you wanted to look up to. Now, one thing that was so interesting about this period of time was women teachers could not marry. Mm -hmm. If you married, you were fired. Now, the woman who tests that, there's a school name for, a Reed school is named for the, the plaintiffs. She got married and she was hauled into a school board. It was interesting because you say, yes, she had gotten married, but the marriage had not even consummated. They fired her anyway. Now, I know a lot of the people who taught me were not allowed to marry until after, uh, I think, maybe 1946, 1947. They married, but they, of course, they were past childbearing age. They didn't have any children. They were treated almost like they were nuns. But to them, this was not only a job, this was almost like a vocation. They were trained in another generation and they had us to feel that we were somebody. And I mentioned that if uh, other people didn't believe it, that was their problem because we really believed, hey, we were good as anybody, if not better. You're absolutely right. I remember that 1954 case. Our teachers, you know, our teachers and our black schools taught, that was the only way we had an inkling of black history at yeah. that time called Negro history. And it was, uh, I called it an underground activity because if a white supervisor came in, we children knew something. We didn't, we stopped the conversation with the teacher and they never knew. But when the 54 decision came through, our teachers stopped and explained what it meant. So thank you so much, Dr. Cashware. Thank you, Raphael. And uh, Raphael mentioned Daryl, uh, how we, our leaders, what it meant to our leaders uh, and the socioeconomics of that and the, the modeling of uh, educators. Uh, yet there are many challenges too. Um, and and Daryl, you know that uh, your dad was there at that time uh, and probably in the middle of that. 
why don't you talk with us about some of those challenges, but also about uh, those leaders and, and what they meant to us during those days. Thank you. Certainly, Brenda. And uh, thank you, Raphael, for that walk down history uh, lane. You know, it, it brought back many memories uh, and certainly uh, those people who, who served as leaders were outstanding and uh, they, they provided us with uh, opportunities to be successful. And it were, if it were not for them, for those persons who were leaders at, at those schools, you know, you mentioned at McDonough 35, uh, Lionel Hoffman, uh, who was the first principal, then followed by Lucius Alexis, who mm -hmm. was uh, also uh, noted as the Negro Einstein, mm -hmm. uh, down at uh, uh, Lord Baconfield Landry, where we had Israel Augustine, who was our first principal there, and uh, certainly followed by Dr. Aubrey. Uh, then over at Booker Washington, where Lawrence Crocker, and you, and you hear this theme going, it, you know, these are all male principals mm -hmm. that uh, were operating at the high schools. Uh, you know, followed by Jesse O. Blanchett, Jesse Owens Blanchett over at your alma mater, Clark, uh, Walter L. Coyne, where there was Eli Witness Sorrell, followed by Mr. Robert Perry, uh, down at Carver, uh, Milton Becknell. And then finally, in, you know, we mentioned those six high schools uh, that were the only ones that we could attend that were public high schools. Finally, in the mid 1970s, uh, Alfred Lawless uh, transferred itself from a middle school, rather junior high school, and became a high school, which is where we had our first female high school principal, who was Shirley Taylor, who was down there for more than 40 plus years. So, uh, you know, it was a male dominated uh, profession to be the school leader during that time period. But uh, they certainly were outstanding. And you mentioned some of the challenges uh, that we had uh, at that particular time. You know, resources were scarce. The kind of dollars that went to the white schools did not go to the, to the black schools. Yes. So, you know, people like um, Mr. Hoffman, who was ingenious, what he decided to do, uh, you know, think about having a school that didn't have a secretary or didn't have a librarian or didn't have a cafeteria worker. Mm -hmm. He uh, assigned students to be the school secretary, uh, the school librarian, the school treasurer, uh, the, the cafeteria staff, the custodial staff, and those schools were spick and span. Yeah, yeah. None of those schools, as you mentioned, none of those schools, except for Booker Washington, none of those schools were originally built for a high school. They were all elementary schools that were converted into a high school. So, you know, again, we started off uh, having uh, less than what our white counterparts had. So with, even with all of those kinds of things, those leaders demanded that we did our best. They just didn't say you're gonna do your best. They demanded it. You know, now we hear things about no child left behind and uh, all of those kinds of rules. Uh, they created rules for us and they uh, made sure that we were able to write clearly and logically. They were able, uh, we were able to demonstrate precise mathematical skills, even though we didn't have the equipment that the white counterparts had. Calculators were unheard of at that time. Uh, you know, even though there may have been devices that the other students had, we did not have those. Uh, they provided not only a vocational curriculum, but also uh, technical programs and provided us with opportunities to become uh, prepared for post-secondary education. Not only did those leaders do those kinds of things, but they did the following. They taught us to be lifelong learners. They taught mm -hmm. us to be passionate. They taught us to be ready to take risks. They taught us to be problem solvers. They taught us to look at things a little bit differently and see if we can solve them. They taught us to work independently, be creative. They taught us to give back to our community. They taught us to persevere, 
and they taught us not only to have moral courage, but to have integrity and self-respect. You know, you mentioned those things uh, as you gave our history. You, know, uh, you also talked about it, Raphael, that our teachers and our principals, they look like teachers and principals. Uh, they came dressed with their Sunday vests on, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, they expected and demanded uh, that we do our best. Mediocrity was unheard of. Uh, they provided us with opportunities from A to Z. You know, they said that we could become a pilot, we could become a scientist, we could become a law enforcement officer, a politician, an entertainer, a botanist if we so chose to do so, uh, a religious leader, a judge, business persons, uh, musicians, architects. Uh, all of those things were things that they put in our head that they believed that uh, we could do if we did our best. And if you're not sure about that, just think about some of the names that I'm about to mention. Joan Armstrong, who became the first African-American female chief judge. Israel mm -hmm. Augustine, first black district court judge. Uh, Lloyd and Walter Harris, who were two of the first black music educators uh, in the city of New Orleans who participated in the Louisiana Music Education Association program, which was for whites only. And I'll tell you a little story about that. Uh, when Lloyd Harris brought his band uh, to, uh, to the LMEA contest, which was at Isidore Newman Private School, uh, and this was the first time a black band had ever gone there, they got on the stage and when the curtain opened, all of the white participants who were sitting in the audience walked out. They left the auditorium the band began to play and they played and they played and bit by bit by bit all of those white audience members came back into the auditorium because they could not believe what they heard and after that lawless band completed its program its music program they received a standing ovation mm -hmm just uh it, it was just they couldn't believe that that was a junior high school that uh was was playing that kind of music and both of the harris cousins they were first cousins attended walter l coin uh senior high school you know dr everett williams who was the first orleans parish school board superintendent mercedes stamps and yvonne bush the two mm -hmm. first uh african-american mm -hmm. female band directors down at carver and at clark uh, Max Spears, yeah. our first school board president and principal at McDonough 35. Uh, Richard Jackson, who is an NFL All-Pro who went to Landry. Uh, Dr. Joseph Bowie, state representative and state senator, first of his kind to have both positions. Marshall Falk, coming down from Carver, an NFL Hall of Famer. Bob Tucker, the first city hall administrator under uh, then Mayor Moon Landrew. Fred Luter, the first black president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Bulldog. Uh, another, another, another bulldog. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Pack, an NBA player. Uh, Richard Thomas, the first commissioned black jazz fest poet, um, I'm sorry, jazz fest poster artist. Dorothy Taylor, first black woman elected to the Louisiana House of Representatives, and Jim Singleton, uh, who was the first black city councilman. So, you know, those were challenges that we had, but we met those challenges and we conquered those challenges and we, 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 we made those challenges uh, as if as though those were things, uh, hurdles that we had to go across, but we did them anyway and they did them anyway. And it was because of those leaders that demanded that we do our best and that we, we move forward. So, you know, what is it that we remember about high school? Well, we remember those, those friends as Brenda you mentioned and uh, Raphael you mentioned about the friends that you had uh, over at Clark and that we became lifelong friends. Um, you know, we remember those interscholastic 
uh, competitions uh, of football and basketball. Of course, we were not members of the Louisiana High School Athletic Association. We were members of the LIALO, right. the black organization called the Louisiana Interscholastic Athletic and Literary Association. And we participated in that. Those Mardi Gras parades that we participated in, oh, by the way, Walter L. Cohen just happened to be the first African-American high school to march on Canal Street with that Kelly green and white that they were wearing. Uh, you know, interesting thing, the many, many theater performances that our students were able to participate in, the clubs that we had, the debate club, uh, the chess club, the foreign language clubs, all of those things we were taught to participate in, uh, even though we had not seen any of that prior to getting into high school. They made sure that we saw and we did and we performed. So what are some of the significance of being in a high school uh, and the culture of New Orleans? You know, while the majority of our African-American parents supported those efforts, we still had some challenges with desegregation. Uh, our children and those children, we had to bear the, bore, uh, the burden of leaving your neighborhood and going into a new neighborhood. You just mentioned that, having to pass many white schools to get to your school. Mm -hmm. uh, leaving home early in the morning to get to school and getting home late in the evening because you had to go so far. You know, it also meant that, you know, while many people supported education and integration, there were still some other challenges. You know, the challenges that we got looked down upon by our white counterparts. Uh, we got looked at as if as though we couldn't. Uh, the fact that our white peers, you know, and teachers only felt like we only needed to know so much. You mentioned uh, Dr. Raphael uh, Kashmir that, uh, you know, it was in the early 1900s that the New Orleans Public School Board said, you know, uh, black children need not to have an education beyond the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that those were some challenges. And finally, what I will say is that if you can remember, just as integration came along, uh, the school board came up with this, and Brenda, you probably remember this too, the 60-40 plan, where once integration came into play, the white teachers were sent to black schools, but those were the young, inexperienced white teachers. And then our experienced and uh, well-developed uh, uh, educators got sent to the white schools. So we lost something there. We lost some culture. We lost some pride but yet we still continue to persevere. Uh, so we had character, we had uh, goals that we had uh, disseminated into us. One of the things that I can remember that at Booker Washington at night in the night school uh, in the late mm -hmm. 50s and the early 60s is that uh, they would have night school and teach our black parents and grandparents how to go and register to vote, okay? Mm -hmm. Because if your application was not done appropriately, they would throw it out, mm -hmm. which is why many times uh, you hear people or heard people say, I'm going to register to vote on my birthday. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that that happened was when you went on your birthday, one of the questions that was on the voter registration application was how old oh. were you? <laughs> and you had to figure that out yeah. to the date. So if you went on your birthday, you were 25 years old or 35 years old or whatever your age was, zero months. And and zero. I remember that. I remember it. Raphael, remember when we were at UIDO, Raphael and I were at UIDO at the same time. Well, he was a little ahead of me, but we were there in that same environment. Right. And Darren brought it up. We were terrified when it was time to go to register to vote because we had to know how old we were, how many days, almost to the hour. Mm -hmm. And if you missed it by one day, you were thrown you away. Threw your you application could... out. If you were black. I just can't say that. That's right. You know, uh, and even even then, you know, our black schools had, you know, even as as time went on, black schools had programs that none of the other uh, white schools had. If you recall, and, and Raphael, you mentioned this, many families would send 
other family members who lived in smaller towns to New Orleans so that their uh, children could attend high school because right. there was no black high school in the smaller parishes uh, uh, on the outskirts of uh, smaller towns. So they came to New Orleans. You know, you can kind of say that that was uh, one of the first uh, uh, circuit type schools because people came from one place to the other. But Booker, schools like Booker Washington, not only did they have an agriculture program, they had the contract to the New Orleans International Airport for the floral arrangements. Schools like George Washington Carver had a contract with a soybean company because they drew, grew soybeans at Carver and um, that was a, a money-making venture. Booker Washington, uh, just before uh, uh, Katrina, had just begun an aquaculture program where people from LSU in Baton Rouge came to see how to raise fish, tilapia, and catfish that they were using as a money-making venture. So, you know, were our Black schools doing well? Absolutely. Uh, but one of the things that we did lose, uh, Brenda and Raphael, was the relationships that we formed and our classmates and uh, teachers when integration came in. So in some sense, integration, integration did us well, but in other senses, uh, you know, we did lose something. So significantly, uh, I'm proud of our Black schools. Our Black schools did well. And... Um, had it not been for those great leaders that uh, we mentioned earlier, I'm sure many of us uh, who became whatever it is that they, we think we are, it would not have been capable unless it was for those individuals. So hats off to all of those individuals who led us in those early years and those six African-American schools and the seventh one with uh, Alfred Lawless. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Daryl, bringing us back to more names, more, more of those people we need to look back on and, and who helped to bring us up. And I, I just noted too that um, Mark, Mark Moriel, uh, Mayor Moriel was the first black mayor. Yes. And he graduated from McDonald 35. Yes. So and, Brenda, uh, I, I, I'd like to just say one more thing at this at this time. You know, you know, we talk about this Black History moment, but I'm not going to call it a moment. I'm going to call it a movement. Thank you, uh, Raphael. Would you like to add or comment further on on what Daryl just spoke yeah, of? Yeah, I mean, Daryl is right about the impact that these schools had on building character. It's something that we are very, very proud of. Those of us who went to Clark, Jerome Smith is a graduate of Clark. Aretha Hale is a graduate of Clark. Max Suarez, now all of us were at Clark, now, again, I don't know if there was anything directly that Principal Richards or anybody else say to make us feel that we should not only believe in equality, but we should work for equality. The person who first began to talk to me about the NAACP was Walter Muriel, Dutch Muriel's old yeah. brother. And Dutch, of course, could easily have passed for white. In fact, on his driver's license, he was listed as white because he looked white. But he was mm -hmm. the one who began to talk to me about being a race man. I didn't know what that meant, that he was for the race and he was going to do everything he could to advance the race. One thing that he said that helped to uh, prepare me was that we can't be slipping and sliding. You can't go to bed late at night, sleep all day, and expect to be treated as equal. Even if people don't accept you as equal, if you know within yourself that you're somebody, if you project that image that you're somebody, that goes a very long way. James Gale, who uh, taught me at Clark, who later became assistant principal, he later became a principal. Many of you know his father who operated Gale Music and Bookstore. Yeah. They sold books about Blacks. There was an example of a successful uh, business. Clark, was, I think, was the first school, maybe the book at the Washington Mighty predated us, but I know Clark was one of the first Black schools to offer courses in typing and bookkeeping and shorthand. Clark was also the first black high school to graduate from municipal auditorium. Before that time, they just routinely refused to allow blacks to use the auditorium. Clark's first graduation was at the Carver Theater. Right. And we got too big for that. So in 1953, uh, Barbara Guillory, some of you may remember, was part of a delegation that went to the school board and they agreed we were the closest school, public up, private, black or white, to make down uh, to municipal auditorium. We couldn't use it before that particular time. 
So we had people who were, were trailblazers, not making a lot of noise, but at, at the same time, uh, doing what they could to break down barriers. And I am so proud to be a part of that tradition of people in the 1950s, not just at Clark, because I mentioned when we got to uh, UNO, we began to realize you better stick together if you're black. It doesn't matter which high school. We may have been rivals in high school, but here we're part of the same family. And uh, we learned that we had much more in common than we had difference. True. And you know, you brought up uh, Mr. Richards and he was known all over the city as a very strict disciplinarian. And I'd like to say something too about um, how well qualified our teachers and administrators were. Down here in the South, where we are, in Louisiana, New Orleans, there were no uh, graduate schools for educators who were Black. So many of our teachers and administrators during the summers, I recall, right. moved up to Northern schools. So we, right. had, we had some of those educators finishing from University of Chicago, uh, from uh, Harvard as Dr. Spears. Columbia. And I'm thinking assistant yeah. principal uh, Mrs. Nemps was from Chicago, uh, from Columbia University, and, and many others. So they, they came back and, and they were just well qualified. And uh, they were great examples. And they also, they believed in us. They told us that we could succeed. And, and you gentlemen have really uh, brought that forth in, in, in your conversations. And we're really doing well in our time. Anything else you'd like to uh, comment on before we take another poll? Well, they introduced us to the symphony. Some of you may remember Lucille Hutton. Lucille yes, Hutton, I, he's a head yeah. pastor white. She was one of the <laughs> first music teachers. And uh, yeah. they wouldn't make her an administrator, but they made her a consultant. And she basically went around encouraging uh, mm -hmm. black schools to have bands. We used to go to symphony uh, once a year. At first, I didn't appreciate it, but then I began to learn and to love symphonic music. So yeah. even though that was not the intent of the school board by keeping us separate, we learned that, and we were taught by people who taught us that, that we had much more than just going to school to learn and to make a living, but to become a whole citizen, become a part of the society as a whole. Right, you mentioned her, you know, uh, uh, Raphael, you know, I, I think about Osceola Blanchett, who, right. uh, you know, started the music program, you know, way back in the early 20s and brought it all the way up to the to the 70s and the 80s, you know, and then they created uh, activities for people to participate in after school and during the summer and professional organizations where they entertain people. Uh, and, uh, you know, they just, you know, made you feel like you could do it. Uh, you know, another person that just came to mind uh, was one of the first is Morris FX Jeff. Yeah. Uh, who became the first African American in charge of the New Orleans Recreation Department? For uh, blacks. You know, so For black, so yeah, oh yeah, the the black portion of it, right. absolutely. You know, we would, you know, while the white uh, programs had the soapbox derby on uh, uh, on on uh, Winslow Boulevard, Winslow, the black the kids skatemobile. had the skatemobile derby over right. by Shakespeare Park. You know, so right. again, and we're talking about all the way up until the late seventies, almost early eighties, that these things were still going on and separate but unequal uh, continued to happen. So, you know, we're talking about you know people who were trailblazers and uh, just provided you with opportunities and made you believe that you could and you did. You know, I always felt, you know, leaving McDonough 35 that, uh, and you know, and I know, uh, Brenda, you remember this name, uh, Sophia Conway, mm -hmm. who She's was- my neighbor. Yeah, who was the English teacher. And, you know, you knew, not only did you know the parts of speech, but you knew the classics, you know, you knew Shakespeare, right. you, you could talk about the Canterbury Tales, you could right. talk about all of those kinds of things that when you got to post-secondary education, even in graduate school, the things that we were prepared for at McDonough 35 prepared us not only for, you know, the post-secondary, but master's program, doctoral programs, and the like. And, uh, you know, as you say, Raphael, they made us feel well-rounded, you know, learning how to play chess, you know, learning how to debate, being a, learning a foreign language, uh, being well-spoken, you know, being able to calculate and compute and to 
uh, feel like you could sit at the table anywhere and have a conversation with anyone about anything. Absolutely. Well, this is this, this part of our, our history, our leadership component of this conversation has been really stimulating. And I think that it's now time for another poll. Is, am I correct, Lynetta? Yes, it is. And I will pull that up now. Okay, thank you. We are going to our second poll. And here we go. Our second okay. poll question. What high school did you want, did you attend? And folks, read your poll and uh, mark your box and then submit it. See that submit at the very bottom. Make sure you submit your uh, answer because there's such a long list you might not see that submit box. Someone is saying, where's coin, uh, Vanetta? Um, he's, he's right, coin should be up there because it is one of the original six um, yes. black public yes. Yes. Yeah, Walter Lewis coin. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Which is where the phrase came, Lynetta, which you are a graduate of coin, Wallow Co. Wallow Co. Okay, yep, Wallow Co. We still use it. So, uh, Brenda, did you want to read the poll results? Yeah, I see what we have here. Uh, would you put them up so that I can read them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Raphael, I, while she's doing that, I just another name came to me, Clyde Kerr, who wrote all oh, of the yeah. music for the bands that were playing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Absolutely. Well, I didn't mention Yvonne Bush. She was at Clark and Carver. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And there's, I think that there's a book that's been written about her by Al Kennedy. Right. Yes. The professor at UNO and who has done a lot of history of our schools also. Right. Okay, what school, what high school did you attend? Uh, five people, 13% attended Magdala 35. Uh, L.B. Landry, one person, 3%. Uh, Booker T. Washington, 16%. Uh, Six people attended Booker T. Washington. Joseph S. Clark, 16%. Six oh, people oh, no. attended Joseph S. Clark. Uh, George Washington Carver, 3%. One person attended. George Washington Carver. Other public high schools, 32% of our 12 people, that's outstanding, yeah. attended. And uh, then there were other private Catholic high schools, uh, seven persons, 18%. Have I covered them all? Well, thank you very much. Would anyone like uh, to comment on that, uh, Raphael or Daryl? about those statistics that I think it's a good cross section and, 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 and Brenda people. before you all move forward we're asking um, our attendees to place their comments and their questions in the Q&A box or in chat and we will read them to our panelists or if you want to speak specifically about your high school experience we're scrolling through the question and answers in the chat box now great so the time when you can tell us about your high school spirit, your high school pride. Uh, we'd like to hear about uh, how those teachers and principals and administrators made a difference for you. you know, Raphael and yeah, Brenda, what? Raphael, you know, you know, we talk about these athletic contests that, and many people think that all of our games were in City Park and it was quite the contrary. The football games that we participated in were at Dillard oh, and at Xavier and at, at uh, uh, Shakespeare Park, and uh, it certainly was not at Ted Gormley Stadium. No, later Prince and, Train Park when it opened. Right, yeah. right, right. Now, you were a little in a younger class than mine, but when, when I attended 35, we were on South Rampart. Rampart and, and Gerard. Right, there was just a, a cement at the back. Right. It was more at a place to park of one car. Anyway, that's where we had physical ed. That's where the football team practiced and they practiced on the neutral ground. 
And when we, we had great spirit. When we went to a football game, we knew that we were going to lose. All of a sudden, <laughs> <laughs> the clock was going to beat us. Everybody's going to beat us. But we had great pride. So in this, in this section here, as we hear from alums at different high schools, we really would like to know what made your school special. What was your bond? What are your greatest memories? Who are your distinguished classmates? Uh, are you still in touch with your classmates? And any other comments? This is a great time for us to share. Let's see what we have, Lynetta. I do see a conversation that's going on in chat from Will, Will, Will Marina. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And she's saying that if we put, if Walter Cohen was in the poll box, it would have a larger percentage of those who um, said they, they were graduates of Walter Cohen. Tell us a little bit more about um, Walter Cohen and what that meant for the Uptown area, particularly as you look at, you had Walter Cohen, um, you had Booker Washington, um, and I think it was um, Forche at that time. So when you talk about Forche, um, because Forche wasn't originally listed as a as a black senior high school. So what it was is. that Uptown Matrix about? Well, you know, uh, Lynetta, you're absolutely correct. LC Forche was not uh, a school that folks of color, black folks in particular, uh, could not attend. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you go back and look in history, uh, when Fortier opened, it was an all white male school. Right. It was the counterpart of Eleanor McMain, which was three blocks away, which was an all white female school. Right. And if you if if you had the chance to visit those two schools in the 60s and the 70s, what you will find out is the thinking at that time was that uh, young ladies did not need very much uh, athletic activities or, or uh, gym activities. So there was no gymnasium at uh, McMain. There was only an auditorium there. And at Forche, there was no auditorium. It was a gymnasium there. So when the boys needed to go to an auditorium for something, they would walk down to, to, to McMain. If the young ladies needed to do something in the gymnasium, gymnasium they would walk down to, to Forche. But neither one of those schools were available for, for, for Blacks. But you know, with, with the advent of Booker Washington and Cohen, uh, you know, which became uh, rivals on the football field and the baseball field and, and with the bands and all with uh, Solomon Spencer, who was the band director, you know, also known as Fest uh, from Walter L. Cohen. You know, they, they were outstanding uh, programs and people had pride in their school. You know, the Book of Washington, they wore their, uh, their red and white and Cohen wore its uh, green and white. And you know you spoke well about your school, but here's something that I just want to add to the conversation, and and that is this: I do not remember any internal major uh, criminal incidents that took place at our schools. We were prideful about our schools. We took care of our schools. There were, you know, you may have had a disagreement and an argument with somebody at the school, but absolutely no incidents where people were were harming each other and causing confusion and even though you had a competitive spirit against your counterparts at other schools it was still a competitive spirit and not one where uh, it, it was an attempt to harm you know someone so again you know I am a proud McDonough 35 Ron Eagle uh, Brenda so are you and I know Lynetta you are a proud uh, Walter L. Coyne, Green Hornet, Raphael, I know you are a proud, Joseph Bulldog. S. Clark, Bulldog, and, uh, you know, so, you know, we are all proud of our schools. We have lifelong friends that, that uh, went to those schools, and Brenda, as you said, when people meet you in New Orleans, they're going to ask you, you know, where'd you grow up, but what high school did you go to? Not college or anything else. What right. high school? Okay, thank you, Daryl. We have some more uh, comments, Lynetta, and our questions. Uh, 
Um, or... we, we do. Um, I spoke to um, someone who joined us who had a lot to say about her experience at uh, McDonald 35, and that was Doris Jackson. And she is the long-term um, volunteer with AARP. Doris, can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> Great. Tell us hey, about Doris. your experience about um, Cloud Run Eagle class of what year? Uh, class of 1967. Dr. Max Spears was the principal then. And I did hear uh, Daryl mentioned Ms. Conway. Uh, Ms. Conway was just as he said. I mean, she made sure you spoke that English correctly. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she just was a dynamite uh, teacher. And that's, that's the one that I remember uh, most, along with Ms. Clifford. Uh, the physical education teacher. She was she was great. She was great. But yeah. um, I'm still, I am still in touch with uh, my classmate. I, we have a wonderful communicator uh, in Diane Marshall, and she keeps us abreast of everything that's going on with the uh, classmate. So that's that's good too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing that, Doris. And we have um, a question or from Doctor. Uh, I'm going to hope I pronounce it correctly. Doctor Sanyika. Ntangalisi, my yes. classmate. Ntangalisi, can you hear? Are you with us? He's on mute, Alanetta. You're on mute. Unmute. Unmute yourself. Where, where you see that little microphone, when it says mute, just hit that. Maybe we can come back. Yeah, we could come back. I'm making sure that he, if I'm trying to see if I can unmute him for a minute. Uh, okay, we'll come back to Dr. Um, could you pronounce it? Antangalisi. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, we also have. I got it. Oh, good. Oh. I'm sorry, I've got a new computer. That's and okay. my and my my mouse is is on a, a background and it's hard to find sometimes. So anyway, I'm here. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, accepting my question. By the way, none of you mentioned one of the greatest things we did in black schools, which was the rally. Do you all remember the rally? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And by you boys state and by you girls state. By you yeah. boys state. Strongness of them all. Tell law and all. Governor Tucker was the governor when we went. Yes. From Coin. And, and those were those were particular different kinds of institutions because I think they taught us something else. For instance, we learned so much about civics, politics, and government and, and yes. practiced it in Boy State. I right. mean, it was a serious political uh, experience for us to be there. And the rally, we learned that we were as intellectually competent as anybody in the whole United States. And we performed and we excelled. And of course, we at Clark won that rally so many times yeah, yeah. that there were those who um, did not particularly like that. And, and there was another Clark High School, by the way, in the place I was born, Opelousas, Louisiana, uh, which is uh, another story for another time. But my, my question, I'm just fascinated uh, by your narrative, Raphael, and, and your deep analysis, uh, Brother Kilbert. I really appreciated what both of you had to say, and I wish that you somehow can get this all written up in a pamphlet form or in, or in book form, perhaps, because the youngsters today don't know that we have a history in public education. They think the world has begun with them, <clears throat> with the the, the little telephones they use and the, and the uh, social media sources and their sense of any history prior to that has been lost. I think it would be helpful if uh, the common conversation that we're having today was something that is a part of the education of all African-American children in the city of New Orleans, especially during Black History Week. I think we need to know this. But what I wanna ask is a, is a broader philosophical question that I put in the, in the uh, Q&A, what happened how did we lose it when desegregation came? How did we lose that sense of 
purpose, that sense of identity, that sense of direction, such that our, our children seemingly uh, were inculcated with a sense of alien values. And whatever we had developed in the era of uh, supposed separate but equal, whatever positive values we did develop from that didn't seem to be transmitted it at, the, at the next level. Now that's a generality on my part because I haven't studied the, the current problem in New Orleans with charter schools has me so pained that I, you know, that I could cry some days, uh, which is a problem not just charters in New Orleans, but public education in general in the United States is in serious trouble because it seems as though we've lost our way. As a people, we've lost our way that the old timers that you all were talking about. Um, and I remember how Jesse O. Richards, you just wouldn't cross Jesse Richards. You dare not. And the, and the last thing you wanted to do is that you didn't want your mama to be called to have no. to come to the school. So you went to see Mr. Collins down, <laughs> downstairs with that board. And you definitely didn't want Mr. Richards to have to call your mother to come to come there to see about you. But I'm just asking in general for either one of you all, how did we lose it? Something was lost in the translation when desegregation set in. And I'm not going to try to give a single answer to my views about why, but I'd be most interested in hearing your perspective on what do you think happened and how well, do we recapture it? Dr. N.J. Melissa is modest, but he was the professor and he was a mentor to Cornell West. So he was also one of the uh, early participants in desegregation and one of my classmates at Clark. I think we weren't ready for desegregation. We had certain presuppositions that whites were better prepared than we were. And mm -hmm. in fact, we never really had desegregation of schools in New Orleans. Uh, most of the whites had moved out of New Orleans or at least had transferred to private schools when finally it began in, I think, early 1970 as a result of the Supreme Court throwing out separate but equal and changing chat once. So ironically, there was more desegregation in the surrounding parishes in St. Bernard and, and Jefferson and other parishes than we had here. But it was a situation where we were forced to give in order to receive, and we gave up more than uh, we received. Now, the, the downside of that is that Whites didn't get to learn as much from us as we had. They, unfortunately, as somebody mentioned, got the best. I remember Dr. Bukri, Olympia Bukri, who taught me algebra at Clark, one of the best mathematicians in the system. She was the first black teacher to be sent to a white school. She went to Kennedy, where she did an outstanding job at Kennedy. So because we were not in charge, you know, you know the, man, the, the, the golden rule, the man with the gold makes the rules. We were proactive. I mean, we were reactive. We were not the ones who were making decisions. And as a result, we lost, not because it's wrong to have people integrated without regard to race or color, but because there was this sense that what was white was better than what we had. And there was not enough going the other way where whites came to our schools and would have learned from us. Uh, and that's, of course, that's something we're still grappling with. How do we have a society which is not that it's not reflective of the racial composition, but one in which uh, the ideal is still the old white values where everything good is white, anything that's not white is of a lesser value. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Brother Kilbert, do you have a response to that as well? Yeah, you know, I think back and 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 Raphael is absolutely correct. You know, when those changes were made, and and I refer to the sixty forty plan, where if a school was 60% one race and 40% was to come to the other uh, school. That didn't happen. Uh, you know, many of those white teachers left and left town. They went to private schools. Uh, they went to uh, uh, parochial schools and they did not engage with us. Uh, and then we started to take on some of the behaviors of the white counterparts. You know, I can remember uh, our black teachers, when, as I said earlier, when they came to school, they came looking with their Sunday best. You know, mm -hmm. we wanted to look like them. We wanted to right. act like them. We wanted to behave, you know, the way they did. And I am convinced, uh, I am convinced that my mother created Neighborhood Watch. Uh, I'm convinced because when we went to school, there were no less than 25 or 30 people 
that you said good morning to, good afternoon to, hello to, and if there was something that looked like it was wrong, before you got back home, there was a message from somebody mm -hmm. that said, you know, something was not right that you did or you didn't speak to them. And many of those people didn't have a telephone. So I'm still convinced, you know, she created uh, a neighborhood and I don't know how the messages got to the house, but, but they did, did. you know, yeah. and, not that they, and, and not that we were doing anything wrong, but they just may have said, oh, I saw Daryl pass by today, you know, uh, uh, Daryl didn't, uh, didn't say hello loud enough, you know, uh, and then when I got home, you know, I was chastised about it. And sometimes you had to go all the way back to where you came from and beg that person's pardon. So, you know, the point to that is we were a community and we stuck together and we were, and we worked together. And when teachers said something, that was the gospel. You know, when the principal said it, then that was the synoptic gospel. So, right. uh, you know, we, we lost that when we start moving away and start going our own ways and not interacting with one another. You know, it's, it, you see it in the neighborhoods now. Many people don't even know who their neighbors are. Right. Uh, so you're we, saying we've, we've lost the sense of community. We, here, we've here. lost the sense of community. And I think that's what happened when our black schools uh, desegregated. We no longer had that community, you know, that every, and, and then the other piece of it is, Brenda, you mentioned this uh, earlier, and, and Raphael, you said it too. Your siblings went to that same school that you went to. Right. So there was, there was a relationship already built in by the time you got there from your brothers and sisters and vice versa. When they got there, there was a relationship and we lost all of that. Right. Thank you. Thank okay, you. we have time. We have time for a couple of more who've been waiting. We have a question, uh, Mr. Harold Bordnay. I have your microphone open if you would like to ask your question. Bulldog, class of 59. <laughs> Yay. Mr. Bordnay? Unmute. Yes, you have to unmute your telephone. Yes, touch your the... Line. Touch the microphone that says mute. Should I mute you? Come on, Kate. Okay. Hey, your bulldog got it. Get... <laughs> Look, you all know everyone, you, you all practically know everyone on the line. We have another comment from Morris Warner. Mr. Warner, are you ready to share your comment? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Yes. Uh, I wanted to I really. Uh, I'm Morris Warner, I'm not from New Orleans, I live here now. I, uh, I just, just spent 30 years in the United States Marine Corps and, uh, and this is an outstanding education. Uh, Lynetta and the whole group, I can't wait to get a copy of this to forward to hundreds of my fellow friends. It's been education, uh, Dr. Raphael, uh, the, the information you passed was just outstanding. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank and there you. was many, many people who uh, I'm trying to pull up the list why the letter called me a little early. There are several people who was, was in the Marine Corps, very outstanding people. And, uh, and they all come from schools that you mentioned. And, and they, made a, they made some significant uh, contribution to the United States Marine Corps and the, and the military. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Wilmarine Hurst, she had a comment. Ms. Hurst? Okay, I see she has her. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I got on the webinar late. Uh, um, senior, senior minute every minute. <laughs> but I, I am a proud graduate of class of 67 while local. And um, I didn't know if you guys um, discussed uh, the alma maters. Um, that's one of the things that the kids don't uh, don't say anymore. They don't sing anymore. And, and you know that was one of our proud things that we did. You know we, we sung our alma mater at uh, in the morning at school. We sung it at football games. Mm -hmm. um, it was really a great uh, feeling when you sung that song. And my son. <clears throat> it's also a graduate of Coin High School, and he goes to all of the. He was going to all the Coin Porsche 
games and matchups. And he actually met the lady that wrote our alma mater uh, for coin. And I was saying as far back as even as a uh, junior high school, they call it middle school. Now I went to Samuel J. Green uh, uh, junior high school. And at that time it was the Green Knights. And so now the school is Kip school and they call themselves the Green Giants. And I'm like, you know, if you knew that alma mater, you know, it, it was like noblesse no bleach, green knights in a rapture cry. I'm like, you can't say green giants. So. <laughs> but anyway, I, I enjoyed what the part of this that I did uh, get to hear. And I hope we do have transcripts and or some follow up about this. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Mr. Harold raised his hand. So I think he's ready to speak. Mr. Harold, we have about one minute before Brenda um, will close the program. Yes. Come on, Kite. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Sir. Yeah, we hear you. Wow, I had to go through some stuff to get that in. Wow. I guess my senior moment must have kicked me. Well, I tell you, I, I, I'm after sitting here amazed at what you guys, at what you guys are doing. Now my phone, you're the next company. But anyway, Raphael and I go back a long way, and uh, we actually, we actually, in boy, you boys stayed together. We were playing yeah. football together. We was like back to times. And my question is that I was also very involved in a band with with, with Yvonne Bush. Yeah. What is done? What is being done with Miss Bush? Other than somebody wrote a book, probably the most fantastic, most the, the best high school teacher she won everything she and everything i just don't think you guys i just don't think they give it enough enough enough, enough just enough to, she's the best to ever ever perform that is in the school as the band director every time she went to the state we won first place she won first place every time even when she went to Carver, she still was winning why are they stepping up and doing more for her just so just in our name can anybody answer that question we can't blame the white folks because we control the school board. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm we not have saying it's black or white. I'm Mr. not saying it's Mr. Mr. Bordenay, I, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Uh, okay. I was on a call yesterday, and the New Orleans uh, NOLA Public Schools is about to celebrate its 180th uh, anniversary. And one of the things that it will be doing is celebrating uh, the... Uh, past giants, and certainly she was a giant uh, in the music area, but not only in music, but just in development of, of, of people, period. And one of the things that we're going to look at, uh, uh, that is going to be looked at, is the music uh, professionals who created and uh, provided opportunities for those people who are now music professionals, and she is one of those people, so stay praise, tuned. Praise God. One, yeah. one one other thing, Raphael made a statement, and I guess with Dr. Sendonico, whatever, I forgot what Haywood Henry, that's what I called him. <laughs> that's all right, a, brother. Haywood Henry, you know, that's what I know by. He made a statement by Dr. Richards, and it was discipline and dignity. Yeah. Guys, you don't know how important that was to me. And I've happened to go into corporate America in the 60s after leaving Southern. And it was dignity and discipline that got me through this. Yeah, yeah. Even in corporate America, it was still segregated. And I was very successful, but mainly because of dignity and discipline that I got in high school, right. not in college. <laughs> so thank you for this, guys. It was wonderful. You guys did a super job, and we need to do this more often. Not thank necessarily. You. And Raph, I don't know, you know all that stuff about school. Where did you get all that nothing about all this history in school <laughs> you went back and find, man? I, I told it. <laughs> you taught it, okay. Good he lived it and I taught it. <laughs> oh, praise God. Praise the Lord. Um, before you close today, um, Brenda, I did want to acknowledge that we have as one of our participants, our uh, long-term school, um, African-American school members, um, Ms. Gail Glapion. So My anything you all want to share about Dr. Glapion so she can hear it while she's on with us. She was our classmate, 59. Well, the best class in the world. Board member. 
outstanding board member. I worked with her on various projects when I was with the school district. I, 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 echo those, I echo those words, Raphael and, and Brenda. She made things possible as a school board member that others dared to go. Uh, and uh, certainly my hat's off to her, you know, along, she was one of the persons that uh, provided support to, uh, to schools, particularly Carver Senior High. Carver had a daycare center for those young ladies and, and, and young men who may have been parents uh, and didn't have anywhere for their children to go and then they would drop out of school. It was because of Ms. Glapion's relationship with the Y that provided support and resources so that uh, those young people uh, could come to school and uh, have uh, quality care for their students. And the care was at George Washington Carver uh, Senior High School, they had a daycare center. And also, I just want to remind many of us that Ms. Glapion is a former Miss Dillard. That's right. Hey, she played Thank a mean you. flute, too. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I promised you that we would end at a reasonable time, and so we are. I'd like to first thank our distinguished panelists. Raphael Cashmere and Daryl Kilbert for this outstanding and insightful uh, and informative conversation. And I want to thank you, our audience, for joining. And if you want more information about AARP advocacy, initiatives, programs, events, or how you can become an AARP volunteer, then go to www.aarp slash LA. And it's on the screen as well. And thank you everyone. And, and thank you, Lynetta. And, and thank your staff and all the volunteers helping you today. And everyone have a great day. And thank you, Brenda. One more thing. If you wanted to find out more historical information, Dr. Al Kennedy, uh, was responsible for putting together the historical collection of the Orleans Parish School Board. You see that information showing on your screen. You can visit the library or you can log on to the link that you see on your screen. And I will put this slide in chat um, for those who would like more information. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lidata. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Good seeing you all. I enjoyed it. We, it was just a, a really good going. It was. Go and, and, Let's and I think the moderate.